Welcome, everyone. This is um, Andrea Botezatu from Texas A&M, uh, Texas AgriLife Extension Services. Um, this is um, another webinar from our Enology webinar series. This one focuses on wine faults, and we have Mr. Luke Holcomb of Scott Labs today to, to talk to us about wine faults. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please use the chat box or the Q&A uh, question and answer box um, um, here on the on the screen and we will do our best to to answer your questions as they come up if not we will have a few minutes at the end of the webinar for questions and um, answers as well so without further ado um, Luke thank you for agreeing to be with us today um, I'm passing uh, the ball over to you all right thank you very much uh, everyone for um allowing me to do this presentation, uh, first webinar, so that's exciting. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing if we can dig down into uh, some wine faults and um, see what we can learn from this. Uh, this is not meant to be absolute or all-inclusive. Uh, as you well know, winemaking is a uh, very complicated and complex uh, dynamic thing that we do, and um, it doesn't exist in a vacuum, so there's a lot of uh, factors that uh, affect these wine faults. And uh, in fact, some of these faults uh, may actually be uh, desired by some people, or at least allowed uh, due to their philosophy on winemaking. And we'll get into that a little bit. So um, we'll move forward here. So this is kind of like when good wines go bad. Um, and it's kind of hard to sometimes put these things in boxes because they uh, bleed over into, into other areas. Uh, for example, um, sorbic acid, sorbate, while it is something that has a microbial activity component to it, it is also something that we add as winemakers. So it's kind of chemical as well as micro or microbial. So, uh, but for our purposes today, I put things in, in mainly four different classes, chemical, physiochemical, microbial, and then environmental and contact um, faults. So we'll, we'll work through these one by one. So chemical wine faults, one of the most important ones, and according to ETS labs, uh, as the number one uh, defect in commercial wines is oxidation. And oxidation is closely linked to reduction as well. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, but this is commonly referred to as redox. Uh, it's, it's, it's a sharing of electrons and the interaction of, of oxygen in chemical reactions. Um, first, one thing that we're probably all familiar with is browning. You can see a picture there on the, on the screen of what it looks like uh, as it goes from bad to worse. And we've all seen that. I don't know how many people have experienced kinking in, in their winemaking, but uh, that also happens um, and is kind of an interesting phenomenon. Um, and then post bottling formation of volatile sulfur compounds is directly linked to uh, oxidation and reduction. And we'll get into that a little bit more. And then acid aldehyde, uh, which in, in many people's opinion, is one of the most important compounds in winemaking. Um, we know acetaldehyde uh, as the primary sensory component of sherry. Um, and we also uh, can, can notice it sometimes when we have uh, like a red delicious apple that's uh, been sitting out and has browned and we can kind of smell it there too. And then I'm, I'm gonna talk about the, the source code and, and uh, you can apply whatever uh, terminology you want uh, to what I'm going to get into, but I, I like to think of oxygen as, as kind of the source code in winemaking. It is one of the most important uh, factors that we deal with, um, and uh, like I said, ETS is considering oxidation as the number one defect, and it also is the primary component for a lot of other spoilage uh, that, that occurs, and we'll get into that. We'll talk really quickly about legal limits on uh, some chemicals that we use in the winemaking process that have um, uh, regulations put on them by uh, different governing 
bodies. And then also ethyl carbamate, which is um, possibly a carcinogen. Um, and it's kind of an interesting uh, chemical phenomenon uh, that we'll look at as well. So let's dig into the chemical line faults. So oxidation and reduction. So primarily uh, we know oxidation uh, as, as a function of browning. Uh, the picture on the right, you can see a barrel um, that has way too much headspace and has uh, developed a significant floor yeast uh, on, the, on the top and the color has browned significantly. My guess is that particular barrel is probably showing the, the making of sherry, but uh, this can happen um, in red wines and in white wines and, uh, in, in, and also in any container. Um, so it's a it's very, very common problem in, in bottled wines. And the reason it, it, it becomes a problem in bottled wines um, is that the exposure to oxygen um, increases as container size decreases. So your ratio per gallon to unit of air um, gets significantly higher as you go from say a thousand gallon tank into some barrels and then from barrels into bottles. You have much higher interaction ratios. Um, and so this is, this is why a lot of times um, people tend to harm their wine significantly uh, when they bottle because uh, they, they don't have adequate uh, dissolved oxygen control parameters. And so we're, we're going to dig into that a little bit. Um, browning and oxidation and dissolved oxygen is one of my uh, favorite topics. And so at the end of the presentation, if we want to talk a little bit more about it, or if you want to talk at length uh, later, we can certainly do that. I'm happy to uh, walk through that whole thing. Uh, pinking is related to the dissolved oxygen levels. And, and in general, what happens when you have um, some very strict protocols in keeping your white juice away from oxygen and you don't allow it to brown uh, before fermentation, um, what happens is if you continue to hold it reductively through fermentation, then also into the, uh, the cellaring and aging process, uh, and you and you continue to, to restrict oxygen through the entire process, when it is exposed to air, most of the time during bottling, um, the wine can actually pink. It, you, it'll show a pink color. Um, and it, it doesn't, it's not sensorily active. You can't smell it necessarily. It doesn't really affect the taste, uh, but it is uh, not great to see our Chardonnays uh, go pink in the bottle, it's, unless you're trying for that, which would uh, be unique. But anyways, uh, so this is one of these discussions of, of whether we should have brown juice going into fermentation or we should have green juice. So you see this as a movement uh, over the past uh, couple decades where uh, press manufacturers have developed uh, very uh, good equipment to exclude oxygen during the pressing cycles. Um, they can, can do inert gas blanketing and, and a number of other things to prevent that to, to uh, make sure that you don't pick up oxygen. But so when, when pinking is a potential, um, you know, I, I personally prefer to allow the juice to go ahead and brown. Um, and a couple of reasons for that one, you, you go ahead and oxidize these compounds that could, that could uh, pink in the future. Um, but also with, with high levels of dissolved oxygen before fermentation, your, your yeast will use that oxygen during fermentation. And, and you'll notice um, brown juice can come out uh, of fermentation looking beautiful and no longer brown. Um, so my personal philosophy is go ahead and brown those compounds uh, up front and then let the yeast take care of the dissolved oxygen levels through fermentation. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, Post-bottling volatile sulfur compound formation. Um, this greatly depends on how the wine was processed, uh, aka what sort of dissolved oxygen content uh, the wine had throughout its life. Um, and most of the time these, these develop uh, in the bottle um, because during the cellaring and aging and fining and things like that, uh, we have quite a bit of oxygen exposure and these volatile sulfur compounds are uh, perhaps uh, 
not very uh, sensorily detected. Uh, they are below their sensory threshold. And then when you put them in the bottle in, in, in a reductive environment where there's very little oxygen ingress, um, they, uh, they, they tend to develop over time. This is why you know, many people recommend decanting uh, a wine when you open it, right? So you won't get some oxygen back in there and this, this uh, and it changes some of these volatile sulfur compounds and how they express themselves and, and you know, the wines kind of clean up. So this is also where we get splash racking. Um, my issue with splash racking, it, it does temporarily mask volatile sulfur compounds um but you tend to add more oxygen than you probably need and what happens is once you splash rack and uh, the wine is aging uh, a lot of times those volatile sulfur compounds can come back um, so we want to talk about how to deal with those volatile sulfur compounds and uh, we'll get into that here in a minute um, but judicious dissolved oxygen management can help prevent this formation of uh, volatile sulfur compounds post bottling and, um, you know, I, I don't believe that corks, whether they're synthetic or agglomerate or natural or um, screw caps, I don't, I don't think those closures cause volatile sulfur compounds. My, my personal belief is the winemaker causes volatile sulfur compound formation in the bottle by not uh, controlling their dissolved oxygen. So um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit here. So. Uh, mention here in the slide the usage of an appropriate closure for wine type and aging potential it's a very difficult thing to um, unilaterally talk about because everyone's dissolved oxygen content and their processing protocols and their batch sizes and their exposure to dissolved, dissolved oxygen is different so saying well you need to use a tin line that's a uh, uh, screw cap uh, or or a saranex liner uh, re really doesn't cover all of the factors. Uh, same thing with um, synthetic closures or corks. Um, so the winemaker really has to do uh, their legwork um, and, and know their wines very well um, to, to make sure that this, this kind of thing doesn't happen. So we'll, we'll move on from here. So the source code dissolved oxygen. Um, the levels in exposure can vary widely. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I believe that dissolved oxygen and, and oxidation has become such an issue for us is because the marketplace really is, is uh, wanting these very clear, brilliant, uh, highly clarified wines. And in order to do so, we you know, either have to put it through multiple filtration steps uh, or do quite a bit of fining and settling um, and settling especially we do that at colder temperatures. And if you look at these two, two graphs here, or the two charts, you'll notice that um, dissolved oxygen pickup uh, occurs quite a bit more at lower temperatures. If you look at the one on the left, uh, if you're pumping at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, the average uh, PPM oxygen pickup is about 0.5. And that's not, that's not too bad. Uh, at 50 degrees, which is, you know, I think where a lot of sellers probably uh, typically are at, uh, you're at, you know, almost three times um, that previous level. Uh, and then you look at splash racking uh, and, and you'll get a lot more in. So temp temperature has a huge uh, impact. This is, we, we all kind of know this by, um, you know, drinking a, a two liter bottle of, of soda or, or, or for example, a, a bottle of champagne and we don't finish it, what do we do? Well, we, we put it in the refrigerator in order to retain um, the carbonation. Same thing goes for oxygen and other dissolved gases. They are inversely soluble with temperature. So the lower the temperature, the more gas you can dissolve in solution. Now, uh, the, the other factor there is pressure. So we know that uh, under higher levels of pressure, we can dissolve more gas as well. Uh, but take a look at the chart on the right and you'll see the average dissolved oxygen pickup of various operations in the cellar. So topping is, can typically give you one part per million. Um, pumping one to two, this, this has a, a huge impact on what sort of pump you have and what sort of setups you're using. Um, what sort of seals your pump have and uh, if, if there's any cavitation and if your gaskets are in good shape and so on and so forth. Uh, filtration, 0.5 to 2.5. Uh, 
uh, racking two to five, racking with oxygen, obviously it's going to give you a lot more. Um, cent uh, centrifuging your wine uh, can pick up quite a bit. Now these are very general numbers, but I want you to pay attention to the cold stabilization. Um, three and a half to six ppm uh, doing that, and that's due to those colder temperatures. Now, saturation for a wine um, at standard temperature and pressure is about nine parts per million. So if you look at all these operations, topping, pumping, filtration, let's say there's two or three filtrations, and then you put, put it through cold stabilization, and then bottling, you can see that you are keeping your wine at saturation pretty much its entire life. Um, bottling can typically you can pick up a lot of oxygen just because uh, you are putting the wine into very small containers and there's a lot of exposure per unit of, of wine to air. And so uh, typically when, when I'm giving presentations uh, in the live form uh, at seminars and whatnot, you know, I, I, I kind of uh, ask people, well, you know, how many people have had a wine that was in the bottling tank and it was beautiful and you bottled it in like six months later it has just crashed. And that really is dissolved oxygen pickup. This is this is bottle shock. Um, so we can talk a little bit more about how to prevent that. And the, the, of course, um, very gentle handling techniques um, can, can help prevent this and, and, and not moving the wine as much. Uh, but in our effort to clarify wines and produce stable wines by sterile filtration, we, we have to move the wine around a lot and blend and things like that. So we need another tool in our arsenal, and that tool would be uh, high purity nitrogen gas. Uh, it, nitrogen is relatively insoluble in, in wine, and so what it does when you sparge it through a sparging stone at the bottom of the tank, it actually dislodges the dissolved oxygen and other gases like CO2. So uh, this is a way for us, when we move things around, we know we're going to pick up a little oxygen, but we can uh, remove it very quickly with um, high purity nitrogen and a sparging stone. Um, and there, there's there's kind of a lot to that, but it's it's also relatively simple. You need a sparging stone and you need um, uh, typically a tuer uh, of liquid nitrogen from your um, welding gas supplier. So same place you get your um, CO2 from. So uh, in, after the presentation, if, if, you, if anybody wants information on where to get sparging stones, what, what kinds to get and, and how, to, how to do it, uh, I'd be happy to uh, walk through that with you because um, I believe that controlling your dissolved oxygen um, will probably be one of the biggest uh, quality increases uh, that, that you can see in your winemaking. Um, and you, you'll see as we move on in the presentation how oxygen reacts with other things to uh, cause some problems. Look, if so, I if I may uh, interrupt yes. for one second, we have two questions. Are volatile sulfur, sulfur compounds referring to H2S or mercaptans? This is uh, one all, all of the uh, all of the above H2S, mercaptans, as well as disulfides. Okay, and the other thank you. And the other question is: Is dry ice as effective? Dry ice is great for blanketing and preventing oxidation, but it is not effective at all in removing dissolved oxygen. Okay, so you have to use something that is um, uh, insoluble as a gas, such as nitrogen, to drive out that dissolved oxygen. You cannot do it with CO2. Thank you. Yep. Uh, and reason for that is CO2 is relatively soluble um, in, in a liquid, so it doesn't push the other gases out. It exists with those other gases, such as oxygen. So um, one of the reasons why oxygen is so important for us, uh, especially at the pHs that, that, that we are dealing with in Texas, um, is that we need relatively high levels of free SO2 in order to um, have any sort of uh, antimicrobial effect. So, you know, at 3.7, 3.8, we're, we're, we're talking 60 to 70 parts per million free SO2 in order to hit a 0.8 molecular. So the other nice thing about oxygen or uh, SO2 is that it, it is an antioxidant as well as an antimicrobial. So when we have high levels of oxygen, you'll find that your SO2 levels get depleted um, with this exposure to oxygen. So 
One of the other things that using high purity nitrogen uh, to sparge out dissolved oxygen does for us, it helps us minimize um, the, the SO2 additions that we do, and it makes our SO2 additions uh, more stable and effective. So this is, this is a good thing. Um, so when oxygen uh, gets exposed or in, in contact with free SO2, the SO2 becomes bound, um, and this reduces its antimicrobial function. Um, and as I mentioned before, high pH levels are exacerbated uh, because of the levels of free SO2 needed to um, achieve uh, antimicrobial activity. There's some discussion on what level of molecular SO2 you need. Um, I think a lot of people shoot for 0.8. Uh, but if you're operating in the 3.6, 3.7, 3.8 pH range or even higher, uh, you're, you're not going to get there without um, uh, having uh, a lot of sensory activity of SO2. Okay, So it's going to become objectionable above around 60 parts per million. And plus, there are legal limits of, yeah, so, or of, of sulfur in the solution. So we, we can't just keep adding SO2 at every turn all the time um, in a wine's life because we, we could add so much SO2 that it's above the legal limit and it's unsellable. So we need to be concerned with that. Um, also, I think there's a push not only in the winemaking community, but also in the market to develop wines um, that have uh, lower levels of SO2 added, uh, if, if not um, no SO2 added. But uh, we have to have all of the tools in our toolbox in order to make that happen. So um, also, uh, so you, you see that oxygen depletes free SO2 and therefore it's antimicrobial activity. Um, and when it does, uh, and you have high levels of oxygen, this is necessary for a lot of spoilage microorganisms to grow. So, um, you know, non-saccharomyces strains require more oxygen than, than saccharomyces. Um, uh, we all know that Acetobacter makes, uh, uh, makes volatile acidity um, and does this in the presence of uh, dissolved oxygen, Gluconobacter as well. Um, Britannomyces, for example, which is uh, kind of one of the biggest problems we have, in, especially in barrel aging, uh, produces significantly high levels of volatile acidity volatile acidity in the presence of oxygen. So um, you can see that uh, oxygen is a cornerstone, uh, a, a pivot point for these microorganisms to, uh, it, it affects how they, they grow and how they reproduce and, and what sort of compounds they produce in their life cycle. Um, also floor or sherry yeasts, uh, candida, um, require high levels of dissolved oxygen levels to grow. We, we kind of all know this uh, because when we have a tank or, or a barrel with headspace, it's not addressed on a regular basis. We get these floor yeast growing. Uh, real quick, as, as, as a, kind of a little seller uh, tool, if you do develop floor yeast, um, one of the things that I found that works pretty well is getting a shop vac vacuum. Um, and actually just sucking the yeast right off the top of, of the wine uh, works pretty well because you're actually physically removing the, the, the yeast um, and uh, that's, that's a good thing. So um, that's, that's reducing a microbial population um, uh, that, that, that will be beneficial for us. So we'll move on from there. Um, legal limits, uh, to be considered a fault, the compound must exceed the legal limit and therefore be unsellable. Um, know that um, U.S. limits uh, can be different than, than other countries. So if you are exporting to Canada, for example, um, or Europe, for, uh, you, you need to be aware of what levels they have because uh, they can be different. And there are some things that, that we can use in winemaking that are not allowed in other countries. So this is where um, you know, the wine is perfectly sound, but is unsellable in another country because of what uh, the winemaker has used in its processing. Um, we, I touched on this earlier uh, with, with 3SO2 uh, above about 60 parts per million, depending on the person, it can be un unpleasant and, and maybe cause a reaction, um, like sneezing. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, this is more of an irritation and, and not, a, not an allergic reaction. Um, you know, people say they're allergic to red wines, and we'll get into why I don't believe they're actually allergic to red wines. I think they're allergic to bad winemaking, and we'll get into that. Um, 
So for for metals, uh, there there are there are legal limits of metals. For example, uh, one of the ones that a lot of wine make, winemakers deal with on a regular basis is in dealing with these uh, sulfur compounds, uh, they do react with copper. Uh, some of them do, and if you add too much copper to take those things out of solution, um, your residual copper levels could be uh, above the legal limit. Um, and so we need to be careful with that. Also, if you have uh, too much interaction with metal uh, and wine, uh, you can accelerate uh, oxidative reactions um, and, and cause problems there and also potentially cause hazes as well. So we want to be make sure that we're not putting out um, uh, products that have uh, high levels of uh, metals like iron or, or copper. Okay, ethyl carbamate. Uh, this is an interesting one. Um, it's formed slowly after fermentation through a chemical reaction from nitrogenous precursors. And by nitrogenous, I mean uh, nitrogen com containing compounds that are that are in our wine, and, and a lot of them are there naturally. And we um, add fermentation nutrients containing nitrogen, and they can be precursors for this ethyl carbamate. This is one of the reasons why many countries uh, have banned the use of urea uh, for uh, a yeast nutrient because it is one of the main precursors for the formation of ethyl carbamate. Um, interesting uh, phenomena is that uh, it's greatly influenced by storage temperature. So you can see for each part per million of urea present, uh, you look at the different temperatures and at warmer temperatures, you get significantly higher uh, levels of ethyl carbamate produced. So as far as I know, there's no legal limit right now on ethyl carbamate. They, there may be in other countries. Uh, there's a lot of discussion that there's, there's a voluntary target of 15 parts per billion. Um, the problem with that is because these form over time, if you at bottling, uh, you know, measure your ethyl carbamate and it's uh, 10 parts per billion, for example, and then it ages in somebody on somebody's counter uh, at, uh, you know, uh, 23 degrees Celsius, uh, this, this, this can increase over time. So it's something that we need to be aware of and, and learn how to deal with. It's, it's fairly complicated, but uh, we can do a lot on our end by managing our um, uh, nitrogen additions and making sure that we're not doing prophylactic additions, meaning, you know, you need to know your yeast assemblable nitrogen, which is the, the uh, nutritional uh, foundation for yeast um, and making sure you're not adding too much uh, because a lot of times fermentations will progress too fast when you add too much. Uh, also, uh, it allows um, too much nitrogen also encourages the growth of, of spoilage organisms as well, and then can also go to form ethyl carbamate. Now, um, it is suspected to be a carcinogen, and um, that is a point of uh, question. Uh, the good news is that most wines are drank, uh, you know, pretty quickly after purchasing and are not stored um, as, as much as maybe we like to think that wines get put down for aging. Most of them are not. So uh, that's a good thing for the formation of ethyl carbamate. And especially if someone is going to store it, they're going to hopefully store it, uh, you know, at cellar temperatures, which um, produce ethyl carbamate at, at, at lower levels and it takes much longer. So. Um, I don't mean to scare people about ethyl carbamate. If you want to know more, I would suggest uh, doing some Google research and um, uh, you, you're, you're welcome to ask me and, and then I will Google it and learn more about it and then help you with it. Uh, so it's fairly complicated. But, um, you know, in our world, uh, just about everything is a carcinogen in this case uh, to include um, sugar. So uh, let's, let's move on. I don't want to get... Uh, philosophical about the American diet and the incidence of cancer. We'll just stick to mine. So physiochemical stability. Um, we, we mentioned pinking and browning. Those, those are also physical chemical reactions. We talked about those. Um, but colloidal stability, this is um, something interesting, especially for those people uh, working with hybrids and may, maybe uh, uh, native varieties like muscadine, uh, things like uh, 
uh, that, that have really high phenolic contents, um, even if you sterile filter and heat stabilize and cold stabilize, you can still get formation of uh, precipitate in the bottle that is not uh, tartrates. Um, they're polyphenolic complexes. You can get those um, over time. And there's um, there's things that we can do to, to help prevent that, like uh, uh, perhaps gum arabics um, and, and some other things. Um, but uh, if you've ever seen um, an, a very old bottle of wine and you're decanting it and you see all the things in the bottom of the bottle, this is, this is eventually going to happen with just about everything. It's, it's going to uh, occur at some point in, in the wine's life. But there are, there are things we can do um, to prevent um, this pre premature um, uh, sediment in the bottle. Um, you know, if, if somebody has a 10-year-old bottle of wine and, and complains and says uh, there's a bunch of sediment in it, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not too, um, I don't feel too bad about that. But, you know, if, if it's a couple months after bottling, that usually means that um, the wine was fairly unstable. Um, so we'll, we'll move on from there. I just want to touch on that. Uh, so uh, the other thing that I think most of us are, are fairly familiar with is uh, tartrate formation. Um, unfortunately, um, calcium tartrate is a very, very difficult thing for us as winemakers to deal with because we there's not a lot of great tools to prevent it and especially in texas with high ph levels and uh, calcium levels in, in, the, uh, in the soil we can have a lot of calcium tartrate that um, occurs in it there, there's no great way to prevent it or uh, try to accelerate its its formation um, but there are uh, some things like proteins uh, and, and tannins that, that can that can help to potentially prevent it. Um, but it's it's very difficult. Uh, potassium tartrate, on the other hand, uh, we are fairly familiar with, um, and you know there are a lot of tools in our to toolbox to do that. Um, you know we can we can do traditional techniques where we um, you know, just chill the wine down and, and try to get the uh, potassium tartrate to go ahead and form a crystal and, and fall out, and then we'll filter a rack off from there. Um, that is one of those things that you need to monitor, uh, hopefully with a laboratory or, or doing the freeze test uh, in, in your own lab. Um, you know, applying uh, something that has generally worked in the past may not always work every year. So, uh, chilling the wine down to 26 degrees for a week and then filtering off whatever is there um, might not work every single time. Uh, and then it also depends on how the wine is stored uh, downstream uh, in, in the distribution chain. Um, the, the good news is, you know, uh, above and beyond traditional chilling techniques, which can be a problem because of the increased oxygen solubility and we can get to, you know, some of the problems we talked about earlier, um, we do have uh, tools in our at our disposal nowadays that are um, crystal inhibitors. Uh, we, we sell a product called Claristar that can be used on reds, rosés, and whites. Um, uh, and then there are we also we also have CMC. A lot of other people have CMC as well. Uh, it's a different uh, different type of product, uh, and it has CMC has some unique uh, parameters that you really have to work under. Um, in order for it to be effective, um, it has some potential filterability issues. So important to think about if you're going to sterile filter the product, um, and it can be difficult to handle. Um, so while we uh, sell CMC, we typically try to steer people to Claristar because of um, how easy it is to use. And I'm not meaning to, to talk about products too much. I just want to touch on the things that we have uh, available to us as winemakers. Um, for CMC or Claristar or even traditional chilling techniques, uh, bench trials are, are, are very important um, for everything. Uh, just be aware that Claristar and CMC are not effective on calcium tartrate. So um, the best way for us to handle calcium is try to minimize it uh, in, in, in the vineyard. 
see here, next slide. Okay, so moving on from tartrates, um, also haze formation. Um, you know, a hazy wine, uh, personally, I, I don't mind uh, consuming, but uh, a lot of consumer perception is um, visual. And so they want uh, this, a lot of times they expect this the wine like in the glass on the right there. They don't want to drink the one on the left. However, the one on the left may actually be a better wine because it's been less manipulated. Um, I think uh, the, the beer industry and the cider industry uh, are very lucky in that some people, uh, may, maybe a large group of their market are okay with hazy beers uh, or, or hazy ciders. Um, whereas in, in our cases, um, not so much. Um, this is different than microbial cloud cloudiness. Um, so sometimes these things can exist at the same time. So you can filter the microbes out and still have a haze because the haze is, uh, you know, something other than um, a microbial haze. Um, so things like pectins, for example, if, you're, if you've ever made Concord, you're probably familiar with pectins and all the things that it causes. Also things like... Uh, you know, some of the other uh, hybrids uh, and you know, native varieties have a, have a lot of pectins in them and can cause uh, some hazes. I, I, I've had a Concord where uh, at room temperature was perfectly clear and you chill it and it, it throws a haze and then you warm it back up and it goes clear again. So um, for pectin hazes, um, you know, one of the primary things to take care of that is our, our enzymes, um, a, a good uh, strong formulation of, of a pectinase or, or maybe uh, a blend of enzymes it can help break those things down. And not only will it uh, help take care of the haze, but it'll also, also uh, in, improve uh, filterability. Um, metal hazes. So this, I think, is, is less of an issue nowadays where, because most people are using um, production equipment um, and tools that are that are made either of stainless or of food grade plastic um, nowadays than in, in years past where, uh, when I say years past, I mean the last, you know, you know, the 70s, 60s, 80s, people probably had a little bit more contact with the ferrous metals. Um, and also they didn't understand the, the use of copper as well as we do now. Um, it, and so metal hazes were, I think, more common. Um, so this is this is why if you're a winemaker, if you're starting a winery, if you're expanding, if you're looking at uh, different, uh, you know, punch down tools or or different pumps or fittings, uh, it's really recommended to use uh, stainless uh, or food grade plastic uh, in order to prevent these things. Um, bentonite uh, can uh, potentially cause a haze uh, if. The wine is in contact with bentonite for too long and the wine already has maybe a higher level of, of, of metals in it for whatever reason um, so just just be mindful that you know typically with bentonite we want to um, get it in there uh, let it settle out and then let's get the wine off the bentonite uh, just about as uh, quickly as possible uh, different bentonites from different suppliers are going to have um, different levels of metals um, and so when you source that night, make sure you get it from uh, a good, a good supplier um, and not, you know, your local uh, chemical supplier, for example, because they might not um, uh, be selling bentonite that is made for winemaking. And uh, with that in mind, uh, it's, it's one thing I'd recommend. Uh, the, other, the other thing is, is protein haze. Um, and I've seen this and I'm sure uh, all of you have as well. Um, and this is, we use bentonite to take care of this protein haze. Now, uh, because protein hazes uh, can be an issue, uh, especially in certain varieties of Viognier and um, some other ones like that, um, you know, we, we don't want to use so much bentonite that we strip everything out. Um, so you can potentially look at the usage of um, tannins, uh, fermentation tannins to bind up with those uh, native proteins and, and, and thereby minimize or, or, or reduce uh, the amount of bentonite necessary and also build some structure along the way. So that, that's a good, good tool there. I'm going to have to go a little faster here. Um, another physiochemical wine fault is effervescence. 
Um, this is great for champagne um, or, or for Prosecco or things like that, and maybe some white wines uh, that you want a little uh, uh, crispness to it on the palate. But for the most part, um, in, in still wines, we don't want it, and it can cause uh, problems um, it, with like pushing corks uh, after we bottle. If we bottle at a cold temperature and we've kept the wine at a cold temperature and been, and have been very judicious with our use of CO2 or dry ice, there can be quite a bit of uh, CO2 dissolved in solution, and then we bottle it, and then the wine warms up, uh, and that CO2 wants to come out of solution, and we get corks pushing. So again, sparging with high purity nitrogen can eliminate it, uh, the dissolved CO2. Um, so it, if in your bottling tank, I, I highly recommend uh, hitting with high purity nitrogen for you know 20 to 30 minutes to drive out not only the dissolved oxygen, but then also uh, whatever residual CO2 is in there, um, perhaps from dry ice usage, but also uh, maybe retained uh, after fermentation. Okay, so. Here's a lot of uh, microbial wine faults, and I have a slide for each individual one, and we've got about 20 minutes, so I'm going to burn through these. Uh, if there is one in particular that we want to focus on, uh, let me know. But um, personally, um, what I see out there, uh, mousiness, biogenic amines, volatile acidity, and 40P, 40G, and then um, uh, mannitol and volatile sulfur compounds are the most common. But let's, let's move into these real quick. So 4EP, 4EG, 4EC as well uh, are all compounds that uh, are, are commonly associated with uh, the, the, the growth of Britannomyces. Now, real quick as an aside, uh, a lot of times uh, Britannomyces uh, populations uh, increase significantly during barreling. Um, and one of the reasons for that is dissolved oxygen because when you take your wine and put it in the barrel, most of the time people are not gassing their barrels uh, prior to filling. Um, and then there's a common protocol to top those barrels on a regular basis. Um, and what we do when we top, uh, typically we break the seal of the bung and uh, there's been a vacuum that's formed. Um, and I would pose the question, how much oxygen is in a vacuum? The answer is, basically none. So we have the wine um, that uh, has, you know, has, has formed a vacuum. Uh, there's very little dissolved oxygen or oxygen in that headspace, but we fill it up uh, with, with wine that probably has high dissolved oxygen. And also when we open that bung, we suck in a bunch of air. So sometimes we're, we're going backwards instead of forwards. Uh, and if you want to talk about that another time, I'm happy to discuss that. But when we do this, uh, this topping, what, and we're putting in more air, we're depleting our SO2, and we're in barrels, and Brett really loves to live in barrels, and this is one of the reasons why Britannomyces uh, uh, proliferates in the barrels. So um, it's important to think about how you're handling a wine and, and the effects of it. A lot of people like to use, uh, you know, do a little sulfur addition uh, when, they, when they top, um, and, and that's and that's a good way to help prevent some of the oxygen pickup. Um, also, some lactic acid bacteria, like Pediococcus, can do an intermediary metabolic function for uh, Britannomyces. So typically, when you have Brett, a lot of times you'll have Pediococcus and other lactobacillus, and they're working in in, in symbiosis uh, for one another. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, mousiness. This is probably my least favorite fault in winemaking. Um, you can't smell it. It's not perceptible when the wine is in your mouth. It's after you swallow the wine uh, and it takes a few seconds uh, to develop. And people describe it as mouse urine, candy corn, popcorn. Um, and it's, um, it's caused, Britannomyces can do it, also some lactobacillus. So, if you have uh, sluggish malolactic fermentations, improper SO2 usage, uh, if you're not taking care of your wine on a regular basis, uh, mousiness can occur. And it's, um, it really depends on the person's sensitivity. Uh, I happen to be very sensitive to it, and it makes the wine completely undrinkable for me. Um, and if you've never experienced it, it's probably because you can't perceive it. And that's just a genetic thing. There's nothing you can do about that. Um, and, and the same thing goes for the rest of the population. Um, 
but uh, I'd be interested to hear from everybody if they've ever uh, identified mousiness. Um, but it is actually fairly prevalent in, um, in in wines these days. So it's an interesting thing. Um, ropiness. So if you've got ropiness, you probably have mousiness and you probably have Britannomyces. Uh, but this is um, typically produced by Pediococcus, which I misspelled there. Apologize for that. And or Leuconostoc, which are both uh, lactic acid bacteria. Um, and you can see in the picture that that wine is, is very oily looking. Um, and this is, they, they actually produce polysaccharides um, and the wine becomes very viscous and oily. Um, I haven't seen this very often, but it, it does happen. And typically it's in conjunction with, with other things as well. Uh, biogenic amines. So this is, uh, you know, going back to um, what we were talking about earlier where Consumers say that they're allergic to sulfites in red wine. Well, I don't think that's the case. I think they're actually allergic to biogenic amines. Biogenic amines are produced um, mainly by uh, bacteria um, that metabolize uh, some amino acids and they produce these biogenic amines such as histamine, which we're fairly familiar with, right? We uh, produce antihistamines in our body. Um, and so it is somewhat of an allergic reaction um, in some ways, or at least that's how we categorize it. So what I said earlier is that if, you know, people aren't allergic to sulfur, they're allergic to bad winemaking. So if you have an issue um, with a stock malolactic fermentation or you're allowing native malolactic to occur, um, you can get some of these compounds depending on the amino acid contents of your wine and, and how long the, the bacteria have to work on this. Um, I've had uh, a wine that I took a sip of um, and I, I immediately got a headache and it was so powerful that they, I, I basically had to get to go sleep it off. And this was not, um, uh, this was not over drink, over consumption. This was uh, a large amount of biogenic amines. Again, you're going to see these things in conjunction with other things. You'll probably have some Britannomyces notes, probably some BA, so on and so forth. But uh, if you look at these, they can be smelled as putrid, meaty, the smell of cadaver. Um, and so they're, the wine typically is not gonna taste very good, but it also can elicit reactions in people. So we, the best way to do that is uh, A, prevent malolactic fermentation if you don't want it to occur. Um, uh, B, if you do want malolactic to occur, uh, I highly recommend using a commercial strain that is known to not produce these biogenic amines. So that's one of the luxuries of having all of these bacteria available for us to purchase is uh, they will not produce biogenic amines. Um, ethyl acetate, uh, this one is uh, objectionable. I remember growing up, uh, my mo mother and sister would uh, be doing the nails and this the smell of a nail polish remover um, would, would just take over the house. This That is ethyl acetate. Um, and you typically find it uh, produced by yeasts uh, in native fermentations or maybe where implantation of, of a commercial strain of yeast has not worked for whatever reason. Um, and the wine is kind of stewing in its own juices. A lot of these uh, native yeasts that, we, that get, come in from the vineyard uh, can produce this. Um, and it can actually happen fairly quickly. Um, and so we want, th this is one of uh, the things we'll talk about in the last slide um, is, is, the, is the cadence of production. So uh, if you harvest your grapes and let them sit uh, overnight, you know, out on the dock or, or maybe even in a cold room or on the truck, th this is where you get these issues. You want to try to process as quickly as possible uh, to get uh, the, your chosen strain if you are using a uh, commercial strain of yeast. We want to get those going uh, as quickly as possible so that they can overwhelm these native yeasts that can cause the ethyl acetate. Um, also, uh, we're probably all familiar with uh, volatile acidity. Um, it can be produced by acetic acid bacteria, lactic acid bacteria, and some yeasts as well. Um, so this is, again, it circles back to dissolved oxygen. Uh, if you have high levels of dissolved oxygen and poor headspace management, and you're not controlling the microbial populations, you're probably going to have some acetobacter get going and produce VA. Um, also, lactic acid bacteria can, um, once they've run out, 
uh, of, of you know, malic acid, um, they, they can then move on to sugar um, to go ahead and uh, produce VA. So if you uh, are doing co-inoculation uh, with malolactic bacteria uh, and you get a stuck fermentation and the mal uh, malolactic bacteria have already consumed all the malic acid, you have a risk of uh, producing VA. Um, so just, just bear that in mind with co-inoculation and also delayed, delayed malolactics. Um, I, I think most a lot of spoilage occurs in, in uh, struggling malolactics or delayed uh, malolactic fermentations. Uh, yeast can also produce VA, uh, like Britannomyces, uh, in, in, and also in, in native uh, fermentations. So volatile sulfur compounds, we touched on these earlier. Uh, so H2S is probably the one we're all super familiar with. It is typically produced by yeast, especially in stressed envi environments or health unhealthy population. This is why we recommend uh, proper rehydration protocols and the usage of a rehydration nutrient and then proper um, uh, nu nutrient supplementation, uh, depending on the, uh, the fermentation conditions. Um, you know, wild temperature swings or uh, adding uh, a large amount of uh, DAP, diammonium phosphate, um, can also stress the yeast and produce a lot of H2S. For example, um, one of my preferred methods for arresting a fermentation to retain some residual sugar is to centrifuge or filter the wine before you chill it because uh, I've seen it where you want to arrest it and you want to arrest it using refrigeration and you go ahead and slam the chiller on it and add a bunch of SO2 and that stresses the yeast out wildly and a lot of times they produce a lot of H2S which is not what you want in a nice aromatic wine like uh, like a Riesling or a Muscat. So it's good to try to eliminate the population of yeast before you um, uh, chill and add SO2. Um, so then from, from there, the H2S that's, that's in solution can re develop from reactions with ethanol and methanol that are, that are in solution as well. And those, those form mercaptans. Um, the good news is H2S and mercaptans both react with copper sulfate. Um, and I know people have issues using copper sulfate, uh, philosophically or otherwise, and, and I'm not pushing the usage of, of copper sulfate. I'm just saying that it is a tool that we can use. Um, but if you splash rack to uh, allegedly drive off uh, H2S, uh, you can actually oxidize uh, your H2S and mercaptans over into disulfides where they're persistent and do not react with copper sulfate, um, but they can be reduced back to mercaptans using ascorbic acid. Um, so if we want to talk more about that, we probably will do that at a later point. We move on. Acrolein, uh, not super common, but if you've ever had a wine that's extraordinarily bitter, um, it's probably acrolein. Uh, mannitol is one that I find a lot uh, is when people have uh, fermentation problems where fructose is left over because uh, yeast preferentially consume glucose first before they use fructose. Uh, and there's uh, lactic acid bacteria in solution. They can produce mannitol from the fructose in high pH sweet wines. Uh, it's viscous, but it's also super irritating. And, and it, I, I get it as a corrosive finish in the back. It's not VA, it's, 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 it's mannitol. Um, and I, I find it very um, unpleasant, but uh, let's move on from there. Uh, one of the important ones that I want to cover because this tends to be an issue, uh, especially with sweet wine production is geraniol or geranium taint. This is the usage of sorbic acid and sorbate um, to prevent re-fermentation. Uh, so sorbic acid is inhibitory to yeast, but has zero activity on bacteria. In fact, the lactic acid bacteria in solution actually use the sorbic acid uh, as a carbon source and they produce geranium taint. And it's, uh, it's, it's horrible uh, when, when that happens. So just know you need adequate levels of SO2, adequate levels of sorbate in order to prevent fermentation, and you also need to make sure that you've controlled your uh, bacterial populations um, so that you don't have an issue uh, downstream. For example, this gets back to dissolved oxygen. If you were using sorbic acid and uh, SO2 to help prevent fermentation uh, downstream in the, in the bottle, but you uh, are not controlling your dissolved oxygen and you pick up a lot during bottling and it reduces that SO2, well, now lactic acid bacteria are going to consume that sorbate and you're going to have geranium wine. So uh, let's try to prevent that. The other, this minor one is diacetyl. Uh, you know, a very good example would be Rombauer Chardonnay. 
Some people really like that. Um, if you have really high malic levels and you put a wine through malolactic, sometimes you can get too much diacetyl. Um, and uh, also, depending on how you uh, add your malolactic bacteria and when you do it, also um, what strain you use can produce diacetyl. I like a little bit of it personally, but I've also had wines that just smell like a stick of butter, and that's not my preferred thing. But it's, it's a stylistic tool. There's ways to manipulate it. Um, we'll move on from there. So effervescence, that's also a fault. Um, you know, in most wine styles, it's objectionable. Um, in some wines, though, um, it, we want it, like Method Champenois, uh, or sparkling wine. But it is also a very good indicator that something is going on wrong, right? If you if you have effervescence and bubble formation, you know, in your tank or in your bottle, uh, it's typically there's there is uh, some uh, microorganism uh, pr producing that CO2, and and you've got a problem. So you need to take care of that. And um, if, if you have effervescence and you have a haze, uh, if the wine is hazy. Uh, that's usually a clear indication that you have uh, microbial bloom and you probably have zero SO2. So real quick, uh, environmental contact wine faults. Uh, so we all know about TCA. However, there are a bunch of other halogenated anisoles that can come from contact not only with pork, but other wood sources as well. Uh, and then there's pork derived compounds like guayacol, geosmin, and, and some other things that um, in some cir circumstances can be nice. Um, but just be aware that there's, you know, cork is a natural substance and, and, and it's wood and uh, you can get kind of a woody taste sometimes or smell. Um, and then there's plastic like paint paints. So real quick with halogenated anisoles, uh, it, you can you can get you can get cork taint from a barrel. You can get cork taint from your cellar. Uh, if you've got wood out there uh, uh, that's been uh, heat treated, uh, then uh, uh, fires like with bromine um, that can also uh, produce um, can produce the PBA, the pentabroma anisole, and that can exhibit itself as uh, pork taint. Um, also, it's important with all your finding aids and, and uh, additives to keep them well sealed um, and not just in an open bag because bentonite and other materials can actually be a sink for these halogenated anisoles. So you you have a wine that doesn't have pork taint and then your bentonite sitting out in an open bag and it somehow picks it up and then you add the bentonite to your wine and now you have pork taint uh, and there the wine has never been in contact with the pork so uh, just be mindful of that uh, plastic like taints i think we're going to get to learn more about these as we explore uh, different packaging uh, options uh, bag in the box, for example, I can taste the plastic. I don't know about everybody else, but I can. Um, also, if you're using plastic cellar vessels, uh, like the uh, flex tanks and things like that, while they are they, they are handy, just know that alcohol is a solvent, uh, and combined with uh, high acidity, uh, you, you have you have a, a product in there that that really uh, can leach uh, some of these uh, compounds. Now, a lot of the flex tanks and, and and things that are out there that are designed specifically for winemaking are formulated in a way to prevent this. Uh, just know that it, it, it is a potential if, if, uh, if you use the wrong kind of uh, vessel. Also, if you're planning to put your wine in a can, make sure that you go through a corrosivity uh, testing because uh, not all liners are created equal and you can have uh, interactions with SO2, uh, acid, uh, and alcohol and the can liner to produce um, some pretty nasty compounds. So I kind of touched on, okay, like what do we do to solve all these problems, but I'm running out of time. Uh, but one of the main ones, control your microbial populations, whether it be through fining, settling, filtration. There are also a lot of microbial control agents available to us now that weren't available 20 years ago. Things like Titusan, Kitenbuchen products, Velcrin, et, et cetera. Uh, I think the big one, proper SO2 and DO management. Uh, pH control is really important, especially in Texas where we have a lot of high pHs, and then the cadence of processing. So you want to make sure that you get your fermentation started and it's a healthy fermentation. And then if you're going through malolactic, that occurs quickly and you monitor it uh, accordingly and get the wine uh, finished uh, with, with SO2 in uh, and get it, get it put to bed. Uh, remediation, there's a lot of different options available to us, finding agents, tanning, tannins, blending, um, a lot of different things that we can do to uh, cover up some of these faults or, or fix them, uh, microfiltration and, and, and things like that. So um, there's a lot to it. If you do have a microbial fault that you want to talk about, um, 
we can we can discuss that. My my email was there on the first slide as well as my uh, phone number, and I'm happy to work work through you with that. Uh, also, uh, the, everybody in the office is, is is welcome to do that as well. So, uh, I guess that's it, and I'm two minutes ahead of schedule. Um, so, I'll open it up. Thank you, Luke. Um, well, nobody is uh, kicking us out for another <laughs> for a few minutes more, <laughs> so so we can take a few more minutes to answer questions. So um, I already have um, a few questions here okay. for you, Luke. Is um, can geranium taint happen without the use of sorbate, or is there a taint that's similar to geranium taint? Um. I'm, I'm going to say no, uh, it, I don't believe it can happen without the use of sorbate. Um, there are some other compounds that are somewhat similar. You know, if you have a wine that's like minty, uh, kind of eucalyptus, that it, 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 the geranium, you know, kind of falls in that uh, vegetal character. Mm -hmm. So if you have some really veggie cab franc, uh, maybe that can come off uh, as, as geranium-like. Um, but typically, if you have geranium, you, it's going to be so objectionable, you're, you're going to know. Okay. Thank you. Is there a way to fix mousiness? So there, there are a couple different treatment strategies. It depends on the wine and, and what, what is available to you. Um, I've had some customers use uh, tannins and gum arabics to um, kind of mask the, the expression. Also using casein and some binding aids can, can help uh, uh, eliminate it. Um, the tried and true method that, that, that I, I heard about, you know, 15 years ago was really high levels of SO2 and, and weight, um, which is not uh, preferred. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to deal with. Um, when I was in California, we, we had a lot that had it, uh, that was in, it had stuck malolactic in the barrel and that occurred. Um, we tried to RO it, uh, and had microfiltration. It didn't take care of it. So, um, I, I, I think eventually it can go away, especially if you're, if you're using, um, tannins, uh, I, I've seen some finishing tannins really help mask the expression of it. Um, cause you're trying to change the matrix in, in, in which it exists in. So uh, it's kind of a difficult one to fix, uh, but I have heard of, of using uh, gum arabics and, and casein in, in, in some uh, rosé that, 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 that seemed to work. So um, you just have to do some bench trials and figure out what works for you, but make sure you address not only the microbial population, but also probably the, the low SO2 that you have uh, and, and, and probably dissolved oxygen at the same time. Thank you. Another question. Um, it says you can't use... CMC if you use a malolactic inhibitor like lysozyme, why? Uh, I'm going to have to defer that one to someone who knows more about it. Um, but I, I believe it has to do with the protein interactions. Um, so if your wine is not uh, protein stable, um, you, you, you cannot um, use CMC. So I believe using lysozyme, uh, because it's derived from egg white proteins, uh, causes an issue with CMC. But um, I'm, I'm going to have to uh, punt on that one and I can, I can find out. Thank you. Um, another question is um, the oxygen cumulative. Does a nitrogen sparge po post procedure read the oxygen and also any effects going forward from it? Um, so yes, the oxygen is cumulative, right? Now, at some point you, you reach saturation level um, and you can't dissolve any more oxygen in, uh, but you're going to be persistent. So what, what happens is, uh, let's say you're at saturation level of nine parts per million or 9.5, whatever it is, depending on your al uh, altitude, um, it's gonna, that, that oxygen is going to be consumed in, in a number of different ways, it, not only in photochemical reactions like the polymerization of tannins, but also uh, in some microbial processes like floor yeast, and also it's going to bind up with SO2. So it does accumulate, right? So it, it creates a, a vacuum in a way in, in the wine where more oxygen can come in because it's being, uh, it's, it's being used up in, in the wine. Um, so you, continue, you, can, you can really get high levels of oxygen. Uh, you're never going to get 20 parts per million in. Uh, unless you put it under low temperatures and extreme pressure, 
Um, but the nitrogen sparging does literally rip the dissolved oxygen out of solution. So it is not available to bind up with SO2 and it is not available to promote the growth of spoilage in microorganisms and not promote the development of browning. So um, I think that answered the question, right? Um, yes, we did. Thank you. Um, any uh, advice on best practices in the cellar to avoid getting volatile um, acidity? Uh, the, one of the main ones, uh, I, I would say twofold. Um, you want to you want to manage your microbial populations. So, uh, settling, filtration, fining, um, th those kind of things to actually control physically control the amount of bacteria in solution uh, is is important, right? So you want to you want to try to make sure your wine is as uh, gets as clear as possible as quickly as possible. Um, and if, if you do end up getting a haze uh, after it's once been clear, that's typically an indication of a microbial form. So in order to do that, one of the ways uh, you, know, you can control the population is, is filtration or settling or using something like um, Bactylis, which is a product that, that we sell. And in, 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 in artists and a lot of these other people have, have, have similar products that can actually go in and uh, it's a microbial fining uh, using uh, chitosan um, and chitinglucan products, and you, so you can actually uh, go in and, and, and they will attach to the cell and make them precipitate out, and then you can filter off. It's very, new, new products; they're very interesting. They're non-allergenic because they're uh, they're grown from aspergillus, uh, so they're not an animal. Um, so if you're looking to make vegan wine, you can do that, and, and it also uh, it, it can, you can have log logarithmic reductions in microbial population. So those products uh, are a potential, but then also a lot of this is from uh, is due to improper uh, oxygen exposure and SO2 control. So if you if you control your dissolved oxygen and use judicious uh, SO2 when when needed and necessary, and don't expose your uh, wine to too much air, um, you you probably won't have the growth of Acetobacter. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Now's the time yeah, to ask them. I'm going to go back. Um, there's, I just put on the screen my email and my cell phone. Um, feel free to reach out for me. Um, and if I don't know the question, I won't, uh, won't hoodwink you. I'll find out. Um, <laughs> It's, it's, there's a lot to this, um, and sometimes uh, you know we, we all need to phone a friend. Um, also, it'll, I'm assuming some people will be at the Hill Country Show. Uh, I'm presenting on a kind of a similar topic, uh, so I'll be there um, Thursday and Friday. So um, if, if you're going and, and want to talk in person, I'll be there. Can we get a copy of the presentation slides? Somebody's asking. Sure. Yeah. Just shoot me an email and. Uh, I'll, I can put it in into note form uh, and, and send it on over. No problem. Well, thank you very much um, again, Luke, for giving this very, very informative presentation. Thank you all for um, attending. Um, I would appreciate your help with a survey at the end of the webinar. Um, if you could just take one minute to fill out the survey, it would greatly help me organizing in organizing future webinars. So um, thanks again, everyone, and I'll see you next time. Have a good day. Thank you.